Okay. Hello there, this is Kendo Nagasaki, Peter Thornley, the man behind the mask, and I am watching Cheap Shot Entertainment this afternoon and, and this morning and tonight. Hope you all join me. Bye! Promotional consideration paid for by the following. <laughs> Hello and welcome wrestling fans to Cheap Shot Entertainment. This is your retro wrestling reviews segment and we're going through the year 2023, which can only mean one thing. 20 years ago to this day, WWE Armageddon 2003 was happening and... Obviously, it was a pay-per-view back then. It wasn't a premium live event. It was a pay-per-view. And on the on December the 14th, WWE rolled into the Orlando Arena or the TD Waterhouse Centre. And it is the fourth edition of the Armageddon pay-per-view. It is a Raw exclusive this time, as the brand split is very much in effect and it was attended by 12,672 raw fans and we're going to look now at uh, well yeah the country was the United States obviously um, which you don't need to know and it was of course on demand before the network and it is available on the network as well the music theme song is The End by Jim Johnson. And in a turn of events, we've got quite a few games that this particular pay-per-view set appears on. 2K15. WrestleMania 21. SmackDown vs. Raw. And Day of Reckoning. So we've got quite a mixture of different games that this Armageddon set appears on and um, when you see the set it is brilliant just at the start of the show everything sets on fire which is just insane they wouldn't even try and do that now uh, we're just going to go through before we get into the main part of the video uh, podcast that uh, the pre-show was on Sunday Night Heat, of course, and it was Rico defeating John Heidenreich to start the show. We move swiftly on. Obviously, JR and The King are on commentary, and they are introduced after Lillian Garcia gives a performance of America the Beautiful, and that is in between, uh, sorry, in between that we've got the um, amazing package, the promo package uh, that WWE used to produce uh, in terms of the namesake of the show and, and saying this is what's going to happen, and it was great. Um, so yeah, opening package, spot on. Can't be said for the opening match though. I didn't really care for this one. It obviously been it obviously been built up from the Survivor Series where Mark Henry eliminated Booker T with the World Strongest Slam. Uh, since then, Teddy Long has uh, started accompanying the World Strongest Man down to the ring, getting in his head. You know why? Why does why does the man keep you down? That was his thing. At the time. And Booker T is just being Booker T. He's very face at this point in time as well. After his massive feud with Stone Cold Steve Austin during the invasion, etc, etc. Or just after the invasion, rather. And, um, yeah, it was pretty standard match. Uh, contrasting styles, which, uh, which was interesting. Mark Henry more... Sort of grounded, obviously the power game comes into play, whereas Booker T 
does have the power, but he also has the speed and the agility as well as having to contend with Teddy Long uh, on the outside. But it would be uh, after two scissor kicks, and no one gets out of two scissor kicks, of course, that uh, Booker T would pick up the win after a an okay match. And I'm just going to say it was okay. It didn't have anything flashy in it. Um, I think the flashiest thing was the scissor kicks because Mark Henry did ground and pound on Booker T um, to have most of this match, realistically. Um, to, uh, uh, you know, get to the end point. Like I say, it would be Booker T who would pick up the victory in this one. Um, and I'm going to give this one, yeah, it's not a great opening. I'm going to give it a two cheap shots out of five. Um, but we would, as a, if I remember correctly, we would move on to better uh, matches than this one. It's always difficult to start. I'm going to give them a... Uh, a props for doing so but usually the starter match is one that you want the crowd to be fully behind and although they are behind Booker T and against uh, Mark Henry there is some bits that are just missing in this match for me so two cheap shots out of five we go into the back now with Eric Bischoff saying that's not how I wanted to start the show Christian and Jericho come in and thank Mr. Bischoff for setting up the uh, War of the Sexes, I think it's called this one, uh, as they go against Trish and Lisa in a match. Uh, I did say earlier that the matches would get better, but uh, yeah, um, there you go. Uh, and um, just as that's happening, Mick Foley makes his entrance, his entrance theme hits, and he makes his way down to the ring. With Mick Foley's entrance music hitting and he makes his way down to the ring. Only to cut a promo saying that he would be usually be in Long Island with his buddy Chris. Mentioned in his book, Have a Nice Day. Watching the pay-per-view in Long Island, but unfortunately today he's right here in Orlando, Florida. Cheap pop, of course, is the order of the day and I'm not talking about Panda Pop either that is a reference for the UK fans anyway he wants to have a party it's Christmas after all he invites someone down to come and join the party who would that be Stacy Keebler of course getting the uh, fans right behind him because as Kid Rock would be singing on her way down to the ring, she's got the legs. And um, we almost get a party. And Evolution's music hits. It is Randy Orton accompanied to the ring by Ric Flair. And uh, he would come down and, uh, you know, give Mick Foley a, a piece of his mind and say, look, you know, um, you need to get yourself ready for our match later on, because Mick Foley would, of course, be the special guest referee. It is at that moment that Mick Foley says, it sounds like you're ready to go right now, so he takes off his jacket and reveals a rather sharp white shirt with spray-painted black lines down it, uh, in terms of being a referee, he says, well, we might as well do the match now. So he calls out RVD, the Intercontinental Champion, and we get the match straight away. And I'm happy to say that this match is much better than the first. But of course, it would be, it always would be, because of it being Randy Orton when he was around uh, 23 uh, so he was in uh, the shape of his life prime uh, at that point in time. And of course, he was accompanied by the wily Ric Flair, who actually looks decent at this point in time as well. Talking about it being 20 years ago, 
um, it is quite weird. But yeah, we get the we get the match. Mick Foley is the special guest referee. RVD is the reigning defending intercontinental champion, and Randy Orton gets his shot at the gold. This match would be. Uh, one that went back and forth um, with RVD getting the early rub of the green, um, sending Randy Orton to the outside early, sending him scurrying to the uh, waiting arms of Ric Flair, who would give him a pep talk and say, look, you are Randy Orton. You are the legend killer. You don't need to be scurrying away from anybody. And so he gets back in the ring takes charge of the match and um, starts taking out the legs of Rob Van Dam, who uses his feet quite a lot, actually, because it's a case of uh, Rob Van Dam, that he's being that kind of wrestler. He's a striker. He is quick. He uses his body. uh, And uh, obviously, you can use that against Rob Van Dam, if you've got the right people behind you in terms of giving you pep talks and how to actually do that. Uh, And so Randy Orton does. Uh, Ric Flair would get involved a couple of times here. uh, Mick Foley uh, taking Ric Flair out the first time. RVD taking uh, Ric Flair out the second time. Um, And obviously Mick Foley being the guest referee, did not want to disqualify um, anybody because he, it was uh, a championship match. You know, no one wants to see it end in a disqualification. But of course, as I'm learning very sharply with being involved in the, uh, in the wrestling industry, if a referee actually sees you cheating, it's a case of why aren't you being disqualified? I think... Sometimes you can gloss over it, but it is all about timing. And uh, Ric Flair, yeah, he probably didn't care, to be honest with you. Um, it was in the uh, in the highlights package before this match that Randy Orton did get disqualified. And again, he didn't, didn't give a, a crap that he was being disqualified uh, because he just wanted to create the damage. And, uh, you know, it's a bold move to have that as part of your character because obviously you can't use that too much. And Randy Orton doesn't, to be fair. He did get a helping hand to pick up the championship on this occasion, but it's all part of the evolution way. And your new champion after an RKO out of nowhere is Randy Orton. Like I said, this match is much, much better. I'm going to go with a four cheap shots out of five for this one. Really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a good contest between two very, very good uh, wrestlers who had, again, contrasting styles, uh, but both had the quickness and the move set in order to pull this match off to a hilt. We move on to the next match. So, to the third match. It is Eric Bischoff's Battle of the Sexes. It is Christian and Chris Jericho versus Trish Stratus and Lita. And the storyline that goes along with this match is that Christian and Jericho had a bet to see who would get lucky first for one Canadian dollar and they were being nice to them getting them getting them on their side doing everything that douchebag blokes do and uh, give us all a bad name I've got to say but for storyline purposes it worked really well and let me tell you something I really enjoyed this match Um, like I say as I have been in the industry for uh, around two years, uh, I've started to see more of these kind of matches. This was a novelty back in 2003. In 2023, 
it's no longer a novelty. You quite often get the guys going against the girls and the girls coming out on top, um, which is great because that is showing that, you know, there's equal uh, opportunities in the wrestling industry. Sadly, there's a lot of other bits that I won't mention on this podcast now, but this match is great. I really enjoyed it. Um, And the reason that I really enjoyed it is because Jericho was playing the sort of... um, He was playing a character that was regretting his decision to uh, do what he's ended up doing with his buddy Christian and uh, having that bet. And he had genuine feelings for Trish and all this kind of stuff. And... um, there was a lot of regret throughout the whole thing. He wouldn't hit Trish, but he did quite often go for Lita, for example. But on top of that, the ladies got their stuff in. They were given a really good rub of the green here. And uh, they they were, you know, on top of this match for quite long periods of time because... Um, you know, they were given that opportunity and I thought that was absolutely fantastic. Um, And you couldn't have any better two opponents than Christian and Jericho in that sense because they are safe workers. They are willing to do anything to put on a good match and they are often do put on good matches. I actually can't think of any match in recent history that Christian or Chris Jericho have not been really good in. And that's, like I say, that's recent. Christian is the uh, TNT champion, I believe, now on AEW. I don't really watch it. Uh, and, And obviously Jericho was the first ever AEW champion. So, he was putting on really good matches as well. And these guys are, you know, um, at least approaching their 50s, which gives me a little bit of hope in terms of actually having a match. Although I did have a match last week. So, yeah, you know, these things, at this point in time, these guys were in the 20s. Um, so... <laughs> You know, no better people to go against than Jericho and Christian and and kudos to them. But I'm going to give the props to the ladies here because they did everything. Um, They sold everything. Um, There was obviously that play on the strength difference as well. And the fact that Christian and Jericho had to cheat uh, to get the advantage in this match. There was a, like I say, there was a lot of that power game. There was a couple of um, hurricane runners and all that kind of stuff. Some near falls for the ladies as well, which is great because it just shows how um, the industry has come on uh, in in a short space of time, uh, circa 2003. But unfortunately, it would be um, Jericho who would cost Trish and Lita the chance to win this match because Jericho was having his regrets. He picked Trish up off the floor, um, having had Christian uh, hit her with a, a big, big move. And, um, you know, say you could obviously say, tell that he was saying, you know, he was sorry and all that kind of stuff. But Christian doesn't give a crap. So... Uh, At that point, he would roll Trish up and get the one, two, three. Christian celebrates like he's won the Super Bowl and Jericho still has those thoughts where he perhaps shouldn't have had this match ever and he should never have made that bet. But I'm going to go ahead and give this match a four cheap shots out of five because I thoroughly enjoyed this match, the structure of it, the way it was done and everything about this match, including the people that were in it. Uh, And that's a big shout. Moving on to the next match, it features Shawn Michaels 
and he is going against Batista, who is accompanied once again by Ric Flair to the ring. Uh, another match with a contrast of styles. Obviously, Batista being strong, powerful, he is also quick. Shawn Michaels coming back from an injury a couple of years earlier. Uh, still, uh, obviously, in uh, a lot of pain with the uh, with the back injury. You can't ever shake something that big. Uh, but he is going for it, and he's doing really well at this point in time, two years into his second run with the WWE. And going against Batista, who is the beast. He is an absolute monster when he was with uh, Evolution. And to say that it was not supposed to be Batista that uh, was going to be part of Evolution, it, it, it almost seems just insane now. You, you can't think of Evolution without Batista. And uh, he proves that here. He's, he's going in um, fairly level-headed, but it doesn't take long for... Batista to lose his head, uh, become the angry beast, uh, that uh, the animal that he is billed as. Uh, Shawn Michaels frustrating him all the while until Batista finally does snap and gets the better of the high flyer Shawn Michaels, who's having uh, a tough time against the uh, power advantage that Batista has here. Uh, Batista, uh, like I said, use, uh, using his power, uh, whereas Shawn Michaels is always looking for that opportunity, always looking for that opening. He does drop an elbow. He does go for the sweet chin music, and he doesn't hit the sweet chin music, for, but only for Batista to decimate the heartbreak kid. Of course... Ric Flair does get involved in this match. Uh, he gets a clock to the jaw for his trouble. He's not having a good night in terms of getting beaten up. Is Ric Flair as a manager on the outside of the ring. Um, but it would be Shawn Michaels who would come away with the victory. Leading to a larger storyline throughout the night. With a sweet cheer music. With uh, Shawn Michaels just falling on top of his prone opponent. And uh, getting the one, two, three. Again, I really enjoyed this match, but I'm going to give it a three and a half cheap shots out of five. Because I feel like because of the long term storytelling throughout this show, that it was cut a little bit short. We then get Maven's music. Batista's still in the ring. He's still pacing about. He's still really angry that he lost the match, uh, as Ric Flair uh, tells him they didn't win the match. Maven's music hits. He comes out and he's like, oh, yeah, wee, woo, oh, yeah, I'm here. Uh, and uh, walks down to the ring with a degree of concern on his face because the animal is still in the ring. Uh, he waits on the outside and... Um, Matt Hardy's music hits and uh, he would come down, attack Maven, throw him to the walls, so to speak. Uh, Batista taking his frustration out on the upstart from the original version of NXT known as Tough Enough. They did try and bring that back uh, a little while ago. Didn't quite work because obviously they had NXT and obviously NXT started out the same sort of style as Tough Enough, but then became a brand of its own and just became developmental. So rather than it being a TV show, a reality TV show, which was big at the time, and uh, just becoming the NXT brand, which is much better. Uh, so yeah, uh, Batista lays out Maven with a Batista bomb, and of course Matt Hardy, uh, is declared the winner. But he's not having it that way. He wants the referee to count 
the pinfall. So he covers Maven, uh, gets the referee to count, ring the bell, count the pinfall, uh, and announce him as the winner because the referee said, "No, he can't. Com- he can't compete. Not in this condition. Matt Hardy's not having that. He's version one." So I can't really give that match a rating, but it, it is good to uh, sort of have that segue uh, as we've had a couple of really good matches beforehand. Um, next up is the Tag Team Turmoil. So we move on to the next match, and it is the Tag Team Turmoil match. And we start off with La Resistance and Hurricane and Rosie. Uh, two very contrasting styles. Obviously, La Resistance have tasted Tag Team Gold in the WWE before, uh, but the team now is Rob Conway and Renny Dupree. So, <clears throat> a bit of a change of uh, personnel for La Resistance, and that does show in this one. Not quite the chemistry that Rene Dupree had with Sylvain Ronier, but um, they still managed to make it work. Not well enough, it seems, as Hurricane and Rosie do get the pin on La Resistance with a flying splash from Rosie's shoulders. And let's remember that Rosie is currently a superhero in training, uh, or shit for short. Um, I always found that really, really funny. Next team, Jindrak and Kate uh, would come down to the ring. Well, they'd say they'd come down to the ring. They would attack Hurricane and Rosie from the crowd as they were looking up the ramp and uh, subsequently get the pin. Um, so Hurricane and Rosie are out next. Um, we would then get uh, Venus and Storm. Coming down to the ring with the ladies, of course. Um, Val Venus trying to make Landstorm seem less boring by bringing out uh, two lovely, lovely ladies with them. Um, And they stand round ringside. And quite frankly, I would be really annoyed if I'd paid for front row seats because I wouldn't be able to see anything. However, it would get uh, lady parts instead um anyway <laughs> they would go out next and they would be eliminated by Jin Draken Cade good performance here by the young team of course of course uh, Lance Cade is no longer with us and uh, Mark Drin- Jindrak was an original thought for um the uh, evolution faction um but it was decided that because Orton and Jindrak had uh, previous, uh, and they were good mates, and they messed around, that it would not be a, a good fit, and therefore Batista would be added. And who would have thought that would work? But it did, and you wouldn't have even you wouldn't even think of it any different now. Now, um, so we next get. Uh, uh, sorry, Venus and Storm get eliminated, like I said. Uh, we next get the Dudleys, uh, the Bubba Ray and Devon, the current tag team champions, uh, defending their title in this uh, gauntlet-style match, uh, or if you've ever played an old-school WWE game, a slobber knocker, as it were. Although you can never do tag team ones of those, which would have been... Really cool, actually. Um, Anyway, uh, yeah, Dudley's come down next. They eliminate Jindrak and Cade after a little scuffle. uh, Managed to get the 3D and the pin. Um, We next get the last team in the gauntlet match in the tag team turmoil, which is Scott Steiner and Test. What a year they've had. Going against each other, Steiner falling off the ring, obviously knocked a bit of sense into him because he's now teaming with Test, who is the greatest wrestling superstar ever. Um, incidentally, I really did like Test. I thought he had a lot going for him, but um, he slipped into circumstances uh, uh, out of his control with the whole uh, Stephanie McMahon Triple H thing, 
and um, yeah, just sort of got left by the wayside. But in reality, he had the luck, he had the he had the athleticism, and he had the power to go a long way. But it didn't happen. Um, so yeah, Scott Steiner and Test um, would show that they are really trying to have some chemistry. Although that again would backfire when Test would boot. Scott Steiner in the face, leading to Dudley's the Dudleys um getting the three D and the win. Um seemingly they thought that they had won tag team turmoil. Um however, Bischoff comes down to the ring and says, No, oh, no, 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 no. In order to win tag team turmoil, you have to beat all the teams in tag team turmoil. And then we see Batista and Ric Flair coming down to the ring representing Evolution. And the uh, comments made earlier by Ric Flair coming to fruition in terms of um, them leaving with a title around their waist because it would be Batista and Ric Flair, who would leave as the champions from Armageddon and Tag Team Turmoil, as they beat down the Dudleys. Uh, d- uh, I mean, think here, Batista gets the Batista bomb on um, Devon, whilst Bubba Ray is trapped in the figure four and there's nothing they can do about it. Pretty sure there's rules in this match, but obviously they went out of the window uh, as Evolution came down to the ring. And you can see why people started getting a little bit annoyed with these things, but then eventually did come round to Evolution and uh, start uh, believing the hype, so to speak. So we get new... Tag Team Champions here on Raw, through Armageddon, through the Tag Team Turmoil, and so far, a clean sweep for Evolution. Next up at Armageddon, we have a women's title match featuring the women's champion, Molly Holly, defending her championship against Ivory. This one was a blink-in-your-miss-it kind of affair, which is utterly disgusting considering that it's Ivory and Molly Holly, two women who could vastly be considered as starting the actual women, women's evolution um, way back in 2003 and earlier. Um, but it would be Molly Holly who would retain the championship um, with a Molly go-round on Ivory. I could say, blink and you'll miss it. It is a shame. Um, because I think these two could have had a decent match given the time, but I'm not gonna I'm not gonna be harsh on them. I'm gonna give it a two and a half cheap shots out of five. They did everything they could with the time that they were given and told a decent story. That being said, it was billed as a oh hold on a second we've got an impromptu match coming. Um, so yeah, I mean uh, I don't think it, it gave the fans enough time to get ready for this match by any means but that's WWE for you in the year 2003 um, we move on to the next match so there's only one more match left and that would be the multi-man triple threat match between the current reigning defending champion Goldberg Triple H and Kane and that is for the world heavyweight championship um incidentally i will say this um this match is probably the best match of 2003 involving goldberg and triple h simply because it had that extra element in it um there is the stare down at the beginning and i think that's a lost art in professional wrestling these days much like the lockup um there's no establishment of what the storyline is no stare downs, things like that. But that is definitely something that should frequent wrestling. Not frequent, but obviously be used in certain situations. I did enjoy the stare down. It established little bits about the story, the long rivalry between Triple H and Goldberg, 
and obviously Kane saying, hey, I'm in this match as well. And uh, yeah, the match gets started as Triple H and Kane start to uh, beat up Goldberg after being hit from behind by Triple H. And uh, Goldberg eventually gets the upper hand on uh, on the two heels here. Uh, but he gets put through a table for his trouble. Kane gets smacked in the head with a chair as Triple H brings in the first weapon. Uh, thrown into the stairs just after he's put Goldberg through the table for the second time. Because the first time it didn't break. And uh, Goldberg laying out. Um, it would then be Kane who would say, hold on a second, you betrayed me and start beating up Triple H. Goldberg was coming with the quick spear and that would be broken up. Eventually we would get interference from Evolution, of course, and uh, that would lead to another near fall. However, it wasn't until Kane managed to hit the choke slam. Uh, on Goldberg and Batista came down to the ring to stop Kane breaking up the pin that Triple H would crawl over the prone lifeless body of the champion and get the one, two, three. We have a new champion, eight time champion, world heavyweight champion, Triple H, um, a year long feud that, um, culminates at the end of the year uh i enjoyed this match and i'm going to give it a another four cheap shots out of five i thought it was a really good triple threat match it had the right amount of let's face it triple threat matches don't have any rules so it had interference where it needed it it used chairs and tables and stairs sparingly but it did they did get used one thing that i've noted here actually is that they did not use a sledgehammer <laughs> go figure um but yeah there, there was no sledgehammer used in this match but triple h wins um like i say four cheap shots out of five overall armageddon great way to finish the uh the year for wwe uh good pay-per-view some down points, some very good high points. And uh, overall, we get to see Evolution celebrating at the top of the ramp with all the gold. And uh, yeah, that's good. We go into 2004 with all new champions on Raw, apart from the women's champion, who is still Molly Holly. Um. Yeah, all again, good pay-per-view. Anyway, if you enjoyed this review, please do follow the podcast and the uh, podcast on YouTube as well. And uh, we'll be going into 2004. We'll still be doing all of the retro reviews for you. That is Lacey the Cat. If you like Lacey and you like cats, drop a like and uh, leave a comment. And uh, yeah, going into 2004 with uh, new champions, as I say. Anyway, have a great uh, festive period and a great new year. And I will see you next time, wrestling fans. Thank you very much for joining me on Cheap Try Entertainment. Goodbye.